1979, Britain voted in a radical right-wing Conservative government, led by Margaret Thatcher. One of her chief aims was to curb the power of the trade unions. She took on and defeated the National Union of Miners. Unemployment soared. Public services were privatised or made to run like businesses. A few made fortunes. Others weren't so lucky. Margaret Thatcher claimed she'd destroyed socialism and turned Britain into a country of private enterprise. Living standards up by a third. More new businesses. 400,000 new businesses since 1979. Over 700 every week. And a better future for our children. Thanks to their hard work, success and enterprise, our people are better off than ever before. But May the 1st, 1997, brought a major turnaround. The British people voted the Conservatives out of power by a vast majority and gave the opposition Labour Party a landslide victory. This is Marxism 97. It's an annual event in left-wing politics, the biggest of its kind. Thousands of people from all over the world get together to debate everything from the future of education to the politics of Cuba. But this year there's a new feeling in the air. A feeling that change is on the way. I think people were a bit surprised to find on May the 1st that you could get rid of a government without just by putting a cross on a bit of paper and dropping it in a ballot box without a policeman in sight. Now, you may think that doesn't lead to anything, but it certainly led to the removal of a government that inflicted terrible damage. And if there is euphoria now, which there is, it is because people suddenly discovered the power of democracy on polling day to do something in Britain that many people in the world would give their eye teeth to be able to do, to get rid of the government of the day without killing anyone. And that is a very important power. I don't say it should be limited to once every five years. I'm a believer in industrial democracy. I'm a believer in uh, openness and all sorts of decentralization and, and so on and so on. But that power, with however limited it is, is a major threat to the power of money. And my uh, assessment of what's happened in the last few years is that there has been a huge counter-attack upon democracy. They cannot really, the people with wealth cannot really allow ordinary people, not just the poor but working people and others, to use the power of democracy to control the power of money. So they're doing everything they can to stop it. Uh, the media play some part in this by controlling what you think. The military are always in reserve. Then you've got uh, the uh, uh, strangulation of the trade union movement by law, the strangulation of local government by law, the, the uh, transfer of power to the Bank of England to decide your interest rates rather than the chancellor that you elect, the transfer of power to the Frankfurt Bank, which will then decide our economic policy. This is all a major attack upon democracy. Market forces 
uh, have become an ideology. I mean, they talk about fa um, Islamic fundamentalism and the Christian right and Christian fundamentalism. The most dangerous fundamentalism in the world is monetarist fundamentalism. Because with monetarist fundamentalism, you can persuade people it's necessary to close their factories without firing a shot. You tell them it's unprofitable. They say, oh, I'm so sorry, and they go away. And uh, the mafia are the paramilitaries of monetarism, because why bother to make a profit if you've got a machine gun? And that is the philosophy, the ideology, the religion of the world in which we live. But you now have an opportunity of looking at what I, I would like Lucy to call the post-socialist world. Because if socialism is over, as we are told every day in The Independent and The Guardian and The Times and all the other respectable newspapers, uh, and there was a, 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 a Japanese-American called Fukuyama who said, history's ended. I was in Calcutta when the book came out. You could see how pleased they were, lying, starving in the streets to think there was never any chance of it changing. But the reality is we can now see what a post-socialist world is like. In Britain, we see the widening gap between rich and poor. We see, in effect, truthfully, about 4 million people out of work. We see 18 million people out of work in the European Union. In Russia, under that great modernizer and reformer, Boris Yeltsin, the gross domestic product has fallen by 50% since the modernizers took over Russia. There's starvation in Russia. There's a higher rate of suicides than ever. 25% of all the inflation is due to the mafia. There are more mafia dollars in Swiss banks than the Americans have given to Yeltsin to modernize his economy. And it is a very brutal world. And it is a brutal world which, of course, has has been made possible, if you like, by a systematic attack upon democracy. And what we are now witnessing, and I think this is very true of the political system, including the party of which I'm a member and have been since 1942, is a crisis of representation. People say, who speaks for us? Where can we go to get our voices heard? If we have a problem, can we put it to, in a resolution to the annual conference of the Labour Party and have it debated? I'm not so sure that that is now going to be welcomed if I read uh, correctly the proposals that are being put forward. And this pressure on democracy and the crisis of representation is building up to a head of steam that has to be taken seriously. I think May the 1st was a sort of revolt by the electorate. I think it went rather further than some people might have wished. I think it brought a lot of MPs into the House of Commons who hadn't been vetted because nobody thought they were going to win. <laughs> I, think, uh, <coughs> I think the whole thing really got, it got a bit out of control because if you go to the seaside to put your toe in the water and you're hit by a tidal wave, you're not necessarily prepared for what's actually happened. But I tell you what I find as a socialist, because I'm, I'm a socialist, I'm not old Labour, there are some socialists in the Labour Party, uh, never been a socialist party, just as there are some Christians in the churches, you know that. And it's a, it's a situation which is not at all unfamiliar. But what I find at the moment is if you make the socialist case, it's so long ago since it was put forward, people have forgotten the case against it. If I say to people, I say, look, why don't we, I've got an idea, I say, why don't we use the unemployed building workers to build the homes needed for homeless people? People say, oh, what a marvelous idea. Oh, oh, there must be some reason. There isn't a reason, except that it isn't profitable. Now, if I were to, uh, to try and formulate, it's a difficult thing to do in my last comments, formulate a, a way of saying, what are we about? I wonder, you know, speaking from the top of my head and without having given a lot of thought, could it be that we are to secure for the workers by hand and by brain the full fruits of their industry <laughs> and the most uh, equitable distribution thereof as may be possible on the, on the basis of the common ownership of the means of production, distribution and exchange and the best obtainable means of popular administration control of each service. Put that forward and you've got a natural majority. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>
at the scale of our delight at the landslide. And the delight is easy to understand. It is the election result represents a, a huge weight off our shoulders, the weight of the belief for years and years that somehow the majority of the people in this country had been converted to Thatcherism, that they wanted privatization, they wanted anti-union laws, they wanted the free enterprise which, private, uh, which Thatcher represented, and the majority were always going to want it. That was, a, that was the forecast, wasn't it, of so many political pundits over such a long period. That was completely removed from it, from us. And the reason that it was removed from us is that we took part in it. I, I think it's impossible to exaggerate the feeling that we have done it. I mean, even by going down to a rotten little place in Hackney and voting for Diane Abbott, you know, I played a part in this massive operation. The, the democratic spirit or the, or the democratic right, the, the sweet and beautiful thing of being able to remove your government, to remove the government, and particularly the most corrupt uh, and reactionary administration in the history of this century is a wonderful thing uh, which we all remember. It's a tre tremendous feeling of elation. The feeling of elation is immediately balanced by the feeling of worry and doubt. Okay, the democracy allows us to remove the government, but what replaces the government? How long can that democratic spirit, that democratic elation, continue after the government's been removed. This is a, a, a debate in the House of Commons about further education. And it's a de de debate initiated by some of the new young MPs, and all of them recounted the most awful stories that are taking place in the further education colleges. Terrible examples of principals behaving in an arrogant and reactionary fashion. Arbitrary sackings all over the place. Uh, and the debate was answered by Kim Howells. Wonderful, wonderful how these people reappear, isn't it? They reemerge out of the mist. The man who we remember in the miners' strike as the man who went first went against the strike, the first official to speak against the strike in public. Well, he's now the Parliamentary Under Secretary of State for Education and Employment, in case you didn't know. And I want to quote what he said here. This is on the 27th of June. The government wished to encourage a spirit of partnership between employers and employees in further education as elsewhere. That can only be the good of colleges, staff and students. Managements who behave in the way described by my honorable friend, the member for Romford, had better understand that this government will not put up with such arrogance or with high-handed insensitive attitudes that do nothing to improve morale or to provide high quality training and education for our young people. I want those words to be seared upon your memory because they are democratic words. They're words which say, the government won't stand arbitrary and high-handed behavior by principles. That was on the 27th of June. Three days later, I think, or four days later, this is what happened at Southwark College in South London. There was a strike of lecturers there, a strike which had been democratically endorsed in secret ballots twice in secret ballots and once in open vote at a meeting by 100 votes to one. It was a strike which was carrying on there and the strikers were refusing to give way on very, very elementary and defensive platform. They weren't going for pay rises or anything like that. They were going against cuts in jobs. And on that day, four days after Mr. Howells told the House of Commons, the democratic representative the new government told the House of Commons that he wasn't going to put up with arrogant and high-handed behavior from principles of the kind that was mentioned at Waltham Forest. At Southwark, what happened was that the principal suddenly announces that unless all her demands for sackings, changes of jobs, changes of job description, changes of contracts, unless all the demands were accepted, then every single person who continued with the strike would be sacked. Now that, by contrast to what Kim Howells was saying, is by any definition a most undemocratic act. It flies in the face of democracy. It's the use of employers' power, perhaps the most undemocratic power that exists in the society. 
the threat over people that they would lose their livelihood forever, that their children no longer have food in their mouths, the threat which one person has arbitrarily unelected, unelected power to use over the people under her control. We have a democratically elected government. That isn't something that comes automatically from human endeavor or just from human society. Most human beings in the whole history of the human race have lived under governments which have been entirely autocratic, over which they've had no control whatever, tyrannies of one description or another. What has changed that situation has been revolution. It's been upsurge from below. In this country, people did have a vote from about, it's very difficult to find the time actually, but something like 1450, from about 1450 to 1832, getting on for nearly 400 years, a, a section of the society did have a vote, 4% roughly of the population. All of the men, of course, had the right to vote uh, for, for people for parliament. Uh, of course, there were lots of people in parliament who were voted by, in by no one at all, nominated by peers and famous old serum, which had, you know, two, two mounds of earth. There wasn't even a town or even a building there. A, a mound of earth elected people in this strange way in which these elections took place. And uh, that, that went on all the way until 1832, when there was a tremendous change, a terrific shift, and something which became known in history as the Great Reform Acts. They always use that, have that adjective attached to it now in all the history books. The Great Reform Act, or the Great Reform Bill of 1832, which entirely changed the situation. The percentage of people who could vote went up from 4% to 6.5%. It was a <laughs> revolutionary change, only, only agreed by the aristocratic parliament, by the way, by a vote of one. The, the second reading of this, uh, uh, of this bill went through by a vote of one after eight days' debate. And the argument was, no, you can't let it go even to 7%. Why? Well, it was the, what's the explanation? Because our property will be in, in danger. There's, the minute you let any control of the society out, to people out there, then the people that have property will feel uneasy about maintaining that property. This argument was put with such force that the increase in the electorate, all male of course, from four to six and a half percent in 1832 was seen as something approaching a revolution and was described of course by the liberals that were putting it forward as a revolutionary process. Of course it wasn't a revolutionary process at all as far as the majority of people were concerned and indeed led to a confidence in employers and exploiters in general so that the exploitation of people actually increased after the Great Reform Act. There was a man called Bronte O'Brien. Immediately after 1832, in fact all through the 1832, the, the time the 1832 bill was going through Parliament, O'Brien was writing in a, in a paper called The Poor Man's Guardian talking about the people who weren't represented and would not be represented after the, after the bill became law. And talking much more about than just about representation, about what was going on in the world around us, in the real world around us, and how undemocratic everything that happened in the world around us was. It wasn't just that Parliament was unrepresentative, it was, for instance, in industry. He wrote this in 1834. <laughs> applies exactly to Southwark College in 1997. They can't describe any difference at all between what he's saying here. Take a factory, for instance. Is not the proprietor a sort of petty monarch? Has he not a sort of absolute control over all the wealth produced in it, though he has not added one single particle to that wealth? Is it right that one man should thus hold the lives of hundreds at his pleasure? or that he should be able to say to one man, stay and accumulate for me on my terms, and to another, go and starve, for I do not want your services. The essence of the capitalist system, which he described, and he used that word, the essence of it was undemocracy, lack of democracy, the opposite of democracy. And the whole po point of any activity for the suffrage, the whole point of it, was not just to get a vote which people could go and marked down on a cross, but was to establish democracy, not only in the government, but throughout every industrial department in society. Now Marx's method was completely different. He came to the idea of socialists through the democratic process. He was the first chapter of Theodore Draper's great four-volume book about Marx's theory is called The Democratic Extremist. 
He came to politics because of an extreme desire to see freedom of the press, freedom from torture, freedom from repression, all the basic notions of freedom. An extreme notion of this led him on to the obvious, obvious view that the most undemocratic thing in the society around him was precisely capitalism, the society which dominated from above in order to enrich the few. That was undemocratic. And until you address that, indeed, unless you address that as the first question, then your whole, your whole qualification to call yourself a Democrat was ruled out. Marx, said Draper, was the first socialist figure to come to an acceptance of socialist ideas through the battle for the consistent extension of democratic control from below. That's, that, that was his inspiration. He became a socialist because he was an extreme Democrat, because his desire for democracy ran up against the capitalist system. He realized that capitalist system had to be changed, had to be overthrown before that democracy was, was po possible. And this is what Ramsey MacDonald, you know, who's normally thought of as a great sellout merchant in the Labour Party, quite rightly thought of as a great sellout merchant, as leader of the Labour Party, said in a debate in the House of Commons, the debate in the House of Commons was, this House wants a socialist system of society. That was a debate in the House of Commons. You can't really, I mean, I read Hansard, I haven't noticed that being a subject for debate recently, you know, that we want a socialist system of society. The leader of the Labour Party moves the motion that in view of the failure of the capitalist system adequately to utilize and organize natural resources and productive power, or to provide the necessary standard of life for vast numbers of the population, and believing that the cause of this failure lies in private ownership and control of the means of production and distribution, this House declares that legislat legislative effort should be directed to the gradual supersession of the capitalist system by an industrial and social order based on public ownership and democratic control of the instruments of production and distribution. That's the motion in the House of Commons. Every single Labour MP voted for it in 1923. And uh, so successful was the propaganda, the Tory government, of course, knocked it out, but so successful was the propaganda that within a year, uh, Ramsay MacDonald was Prime Minister. But the gradual supersession, comrades, that is how they were going to do it. We're going to wear capitalism down by constantly getting elected, by getting Labour governments in, and we're going to take little bits of it here and there, not going to have anything unpleasant about it. We're going to take them bits here and bits there. We're going to take little bits of capitalism, and we're going to take it together until one day we'll wake up and they'll all have gone. The whole of capitalism will have gone, and it will be replaced by a socialist system, by gradual supersession. It's the gradual supersession party, the GSP. They'll, if they do it slowly, they'll do it bit by bit. They will take it bit by bit. That's how they're going to do it. And Labour governments were elected. It wasn't that they weren't able to get the majorities. They got the majorities. And it seems so logical, doesn't it? But the argument that if you have a majority in the House of Commons and you have Labour ministers, that you can enact at least what you're going to say you're going to enact, or that you can enact what the people who vote for you want you to enact, those, that argument seems so obvious, so easy. You're there, you're in office. But all those periods of government, what's marked them out? What's marked them out has been a permanent tussle between those aspirations, the aspirations of the people down below, the democratic aspirations, the democracy on the one hand, the democracy of what people wanted, we want a society over which we're in control. We want a society in which, by and large, the means of production are in public ownership. Uh, we want democratic control of those means of production. We want a decent welfare system. We want a decent standard of life. We don't want to be bullied and humiliated all our lives. Those are democratic aspirations. They wanted those, the conflict between that and the priorities of capitalism, which are completely opposite to that. But the general pattern of all this period is utterly plain and written in really countless books and countless diaries, sets of diaries, the great diaries of Cross, uh, Barbara Castle, Richard Crossman, Tony Benn, the people, the ministers who actually took part in these governments, particularly in the 60s and in the 40s as well. The million, you look at the diaries of these men and you'll see reflected in the diaries, but also reflected in the people who commentated at the time is the total failure to reach the aspirations of the people who voted. And it's obvious why they failed. It's perfectly plain and obvious why they failed. 
And that is that this transfer of power, the transfer of power through the vote, did not transfer the power where the power really matters. It didn't transfer the power in industry, in the banks, in the media, in the judiciary, in the armed services, in the police, in all the real areas of society where power flows through all the time, every day in the society. There's no elections for any of these places every day. The five yearly elections to parliament had, a, had no chance at all in establishing any democratic priorities. The result of it all is, in 1997, that we have a Labour government elected against all the wishes of the, the declared wishes of its people. All the polls say that people want roughly the things that I've mentioned earlier. They want Clause 4. The majority of Labour Party members want Clause 4. They may have voted against it in the Labour Party, but they want the public control of industry, they want more equality, they want the rich humble, they want all those things. We have a Labour government which, in spite of the fact that the electorate want that, have abandoned all their socialist aspirations. Abandoned all of them. They have no socialist aspirations. There's an inability to achieve any socialism before as a result of them saying, well, we won't even try to achieve them anymore. The question I just want to ask is this. Okay, they've abolished their socialist aspirations, what about their democratic aspirations? Has their democracy flourished when they've abandoned their socialist aspirations? On the contrary, the democracy has suffered. Democracy has been as much a victim of this process as socialism has. You think of all those areas of quangos which were elected by the Tory government. Whole great tracts of society passed over to undemocratic institutions, appointees, patrons, people who've given the party money, they're all still there. There's no suggestion that any of these should be abolished. Therefore, the democratic accountability has suffered as a result of it. Pretty well everything that the Labour government planned to do, everything that they says day by day, fails in the test of increasing control from below. Everything that they do have no intention of changing the control of society, and therefore they will make it an uglier, a less democratic, and a more unequal society before. The great mistake which socialists sometimes make, not very often, is to say, well, we won't have anything to do with democracy at all. That democracy itself is a bourgeois concept. I've heard people use the expressions bourgeois freedoms. The only freedom, the only bourgeois freedom there is, as a matter of fact, is the freedom to make more money at other people's expense. That's the only freedom, the only way time you can use the word freedom in connection with bourgeois society or capitalist society. That the freedom of the press, the freedom of asylum, the freedom to trial by jury, all these old-fashioned freedoms are nothing whatever to do with bourgeoisie. They're freedoms which the working class are utterly dependent upon, central to the way in which we continue. If we're to build something new, then we're going to have to build it in a way in which is approachable, which people will respond to. And when Marx started in 1844, when he'd been talking to the workers in Paris, a new organization, he said this, and I think we should take this on board too. In this way, we should avoid presenting ourselves to the world in a doctrinaire fashion, declaring, here is truth, bow down and worship it. We should develop new principles for the world out of its old principles. We must not say to the world, stop your quarrels. They are foolish and listen to us, for we possess the real truth. Instead, we must show the world why it struggles and this consciousness is a thing it must acquire, whether it likes it or not. Socialism and democracy are not opposites, comrades. One is not superior or inferior to another. They are indivisible. They are different descriptions of the same thing. You can't have socialism without democracy, and you can't have democracy without socialism. And just as Marx, as part of his struggle for socialism, fought to extend the franchise from below, so socialists today have to defend democracy from below constantly to expose the contradictions between a society which calls itself democratic but which treats most of its citizens like serfs and to work together with enthusiasm with anyone at all who will join us in that cause.
kind of divisions. The idea somehow that inequality is being abolished, the idea that the market is fair, the idea that people get what is due to them is really grotesquely not the case when you look at the world today. And I think when you say seven men, seven people in the world, have more wealth than, uh, have enough wealth to er eradicate this poverty, it, it's probably an argument for individual terrorism, to be honest. You think, you think to yourself, well, seven people, you know, I mean, however much of a pacifist you might be, you could probably weigh up the balance and think, this is probably quite a good thing. The real problem, and one of the things you may have noticed about capitalism, that even when, like Robert Maxwell, they fall off their boat or some other terrible fate befalls them, there's always somebody there to take their place. And therefore, the individual terrorism might be appealing to people, but what do you find? You find that even when some of them go, there's other ones to take their place. And the reason there's other ones to take their place is because, of course, we don't just live in a system where individuals are greedy. They are greedy. You only have to look at the dividends of the fat cats and so on, but we live in a world which is based on a system of exploitation. Now this is really what the debate is about and when you look at it, you talk about moving into the new century, you're moving into once again, just as the whole of this century has been about, again the struggle for who gets the wealth in this society. Is it going to be a tiny minority of exploiters or is it going to be wealth which is produced and used for the benefit of the vast majority of people, for more schools, for more hospitals, for more, uh, more things that people really, uh, really lead. And the problem is, when you are Asked, why are we having this discussion today? Of course, one of the reasons is not that capitalism is bad. We've known this for, you know, 200 years. Well, we haven't personally, but people, uh, people have known this for 200 years. The real problem is that really when you look at it, when the argument about how do you get the wealth from the exploiters, how we do, do we get more for ordinary working people, of course you find that old labour hasn't worked either. I mean, that is the simple truth. If you look at what old labour has really delivered over the, uh, over the past century, then really it's been a process of Labour governments, by and large, disappointing people. And people vote for them, expecting much more, hoping they'll get much more, and finding that they're disappointed. I mean, if you look at 1979, you know, Tony Blair always uh, argues, you know, that now we've got rid of all the old, you know, 1970s trade union attitudes and so on and so forth. Actually, if you look at why Labour lost in 1979, you can argue, there's lots of argument about why Labour lost in 1979. One thing is absolutely clear, it didn't lose because it was too left-wing. It lost because it attacked working people so much, and that was why people turned against it in the way that they did. And therefore, you look at it, you say that really the problem with past Labour governments is that they ended up running capitalism because they didn't challenge the power of the system. When I travel around the country and you go to different towns and you speak to meetings, I always say to myself, if you've got 50 people off the streets from Birmingham or Manchester or Liverpool or any of the places you talk about and say to them, how would you make this society better? How would you make Liverpool a better place? How would you make it better for people to live in? I don't know what they'd come up with, but I do know probably they'd say we need more hospitals, we need more childcare, the pensioners need more money. What we do know is they wouldn't say, let's sack the drivers on Southwest trains and then find we haven't got enough trains to run people to work. They wouldn't say that. They wouldn't say, like they did in Hillingdon last year, let's stop everybody over 75 being able to come for treatment in hospitals. They wouldn't say that. They wouldn't say, let's link the pensions to prices rather than earnings so that pensioners are £23 a week worse off than they otherwise would be. They wouldn't say any of these things. And I think we have to say, we can run and control society. And that is what socialism is. Socialism isn't about from above, it's about what people do from below. It's about people themselves running and controlling society, producing for need, democratically deciding where that wealth that's produced goes to. A hundred years ago, when you look at the possibility of Labour going, you know, long before Labour formed a government, the possibility of reform of the system, of peaceful reform, of gradual reform, Looked a possibility. Really, Blair as marks the end of the reform road. He marks the end of the possibility of really being able to achieve that. And revolution, I believe, is possible if we really understand and achieve our power. And here, the 
force for doing that is a newer and a bigger working class than has actually ever existed before. You know, when I grew up in the 1950s, all the little girls who lived near me wanted to be air hostesses, which was regarded as a very glamorous. I didn't. I was too short, so um, I never, I never uh, considered it. But uh, you know, they wanted to. Uh, they thought it was glamorous. You'd, uh, you'd have a very exciting job. It was better paid than most jobs. You'd meet a rich man flying around the world and marry him, and all this kind of thing was what people believed. Now these are the same people. They're not called air hostesses anymore. They're called cabin crew. These are the same people who are talking about going on strike this week. And when you talk about a working class which encompasses these people as well as the engineers, and we still have five million manual workers in this country, as well as all the traditional working class, we talk about a real power who can really act to change the world. And therefore, the working class really is the future of the next century. A working class party is part of the future of the next century. And we need a working class revolution in order to organize to overthrow the system, which has really bred the inequality under which we suffer and which has kept us down for so long and which we have the power to organise in order to get rid of. That is really what our vision of the 21st century should look like and it's a vision which isn't worth simply worth having, it's also a vision which is worth fighting for. In the past, strikes were a powerful political force. The general strike of 1926 paralysed Britain. Many thought the country was on the brink of revolution. In 1974, a miners' strike led to the fall of a Conservative government. In 1984, the miners struck again. But this time, the strike was crushed. A defeat for the entire trade union movement. But recently, there have been signs of a change. Some workers have taken action. Strikes are coming back. One bitter dispute has been in the Magnet Kitchen Factory in Darlington, where 300 workers came out on strike over wages and conditions of employment. In Magnet, there was no democracy. Our strikers had an official ballot. They voted for strike action. They'd been out one week when they received this ultimatum from management. And this is what it says. I hereby confirm that I do not sympathize, support, or wish to take part in, nor do I intend at any time in the future to sympathize, support, or take part in any industrial action being taken by the majority of the staff at Magnet Darlington. Sign or be sacked. Well, over 300 of our workers stood together outside those gates and were locked out because they weren't going to give up their union rights. They were going to stand together and fight back to a bully boy management. It's not... <laughs> it's not right that all these managers, Alan Borkett on a thousand pound a day, one director, £180,000 bonus. The company secretary, £500 a week pay rise. And yet they wanted to de-skill these workers and reduce their wages by £53 a week. And the man they put in to do it, they brought him in from Blue Circle, David Williams, had been there 42 days, and he sacked men that had been there for 42 years. He bragged in the papers afterwards that he wanted a greenfield site. He wanted a workforce with a can-do attitude. Well, we'll show him what we can do. And he hasn't got a greenfield site. We have had £35 a week strike pay. But when you've got nothing else at all coming in, you just don't know how to manage, you know. 
Well, I had a worker ring me up in the middle of the night and he said, you know, he just felt suicidal. He's in his 50s. He didn't think it was worth going on anymore. And this is the reality of a strike. You know, it's not militant people coming out. These are hard-working, decent people who've worked there for years and years. They've gone in whether they've had the flu, whether they've been ill. They've done everything that management wanted. And this is the way that management have repaired them, sacking them nine days after they came out on official strike. One of the most well-known industrial battles has been fought by the Liverpool Dockers, sacked after they refused to cross a picket line. We're not on strike, you know. We're fighting back against all those horrors of the years of Tory oppression, you know. The, all those horrible swear words like uh, deregulation and uh, part-time working and personal contracts and globalisation and price factor equalisation. They're all lovely, wonderful terms, aren't they? Which just illustrates how much the bosses will squeeze you. People have to make a decision. Do they want to face or do they want to fees? Well, I want success, I want to face, I don't want to fees. I've had enough of being pushed down. So our message is, come and join us. Another group who've continued campaigning despite being sacked are the Hillingdon Hospital workers. They used to work for the National Health Service, but were privatised and received a 20% pay cut. It's, it's disgusting what it's, they did to us. It's but we are human, we want our job back. Because job belong to us, not from to private contractor. They cut our wages 20% and they force us to accept it. We was a low paid workers, women, ethnic at a part time. They only pick us. If they can get away with the here, Hellingdon Hospital, they can get away anywhere, any part of the country. This is a people's life. And a, no should, nobody should play people's life. This is our children, bread and butter. But one thing, we've got a dignity, we're still there. Yeah. That's one thing, we still fight goes on very strongly. You will keep on fighting. Okay. We, we will, we will. Yeah, we will. will get our job back, that's the bottom line. And among workers across a range of other industries too, there's evidence of growing discontent. People have just suffered so much in the last few years. You know, job losses, conditions have been lost, attendance patterns, and they're very bitter about the company. Basically, we're treated like school children. We're treated like naughty school children. And you, you, anyone in any, in any workplace across the country will tell you the same thing. This is the type of management that the 18 years of the Tories bred, arrogant, contemptuous. But the flip side again is they've absolutely no idea what's going on on the ground. And when the anger hits back at them, they're going to get a big shock. I think, you know, I think the 1st of May and the size of a Labour majority you know, absolutely demonstrates how much people inside of this country want change. And the Labour government has absolutely committed itself to Tory spending plans, which means that there has to be a clash. At some point in the future, there will be a clash between the Labour government's aims of keeping down public spending and the working class's aims on the other side of change and decent provisions, etc. That will erupt in strikes. Whether they'll be big strikes or whether they'll be little strikes depends on the level of organisation on the ground. Disappointment with the Blair government is growing among workers. When I met Tony Blair, he was my hero. I thought he was going to solve all our problems. But when I met him, a few minutes into the conversation, he asked me what Magnet made. Now, I'd written to him two months previously as secretary of the support group to enlist his support, and I explained all about the strike. We're in his constituency, and he didn't know what Magnet made. Many trade unionists are deeply unhappy with their own national leaders. And the general secretaries, you know, we've had to go and beg for money from them. That's an absolute scandal. We shouldn't have to go and beg when we're in official dispute. They should be proud to come out. The lesson of the 1980s is this simply, that workers were prepared to break the law in order to be able to defend their jobs and stand up to the Tory government, but the trade union leaders never ever backed them up. Since the 1st of May, we've got a Labour government in power. Absolutely now, the trade union leaders should be backing up workers who are prepared to stand up and break the law. The law is unjust. The law defends the bosses. I want the unions to get off their knees and stand up and be counted. We're an official strike. We've taken Margaret Thatcher's ballot. We've done everything right, and yet nobody seems to help us. What 
General Secretary. I asked him for support. I smiled at him and he sent me four diaries. Not even I can fill four diaries. I shook his hand the next time I met him and he sent 250 quid for the kids' party. When we were desperate, I chatted him up for five minutes on the phone and he sent 1,100 pounds. And I tell you, I can't wait to meet him again. <laughs> we're a very affluent country, a very rich country, and yet the wealth is all going one way. Well, it's about time, and we have got the ability, there's a Labour government in power, we've got a very, very strong trade union institution, well, let's use it. Let's put it into power and let's put it into place. Even just the threat of a national dispute would force these people to talk to us. The unions were formed to stand up for injustices in the workplace. And yet, this isn't just going on in Magnet, it's happening all over the country. People approach me in the street and they come to my home and they tell us not to give up because the same thing is happening to them in their workplace. I want the unions to get up off their knees and stand up for the Hillingdon workers and stand up for the Magnus strikers and the dockers. The unions were formed to stop injustice in the workplace and yet every day people come up to me and say don't give up because this is happening in our workplace. We've got to keep on and fight for justice. Please keep supporting us. Thank you. Among many on the left, the landslide defeat of the Tory government provides a sense of real achievement, that change has happened. But how real is this change? It was marvellous though, wasn't it? I mean, you, you walk around and sometimes say, oh, f***, they haven't got a Tory government anymore, and then you're just cheerful for about five minutes. <laughs> because it's hard to actually remember that we haven't got a Tory government, because things are remarkably similar. <laughs> It's like a, a terrible doctor's joke where you wake up after I come out of the anaesthetic and the doctor says, well, the good news is that the transplant is taken, but the bad news is that the other bloke has got the same thing as you. <laughs> the man who's in charge of the Welfare to Work programme is the head of the Prudential Insurance. A man who, when he was chairman of Reed or chief executive at Reed, sacked people in enormous numbers and smashed the union. Now, this is a man they brought in to, to run their welfare to work, welfare to work program, where he spent most of his life sending people exactly the opposite direction, from work to welfare. The Labour are in a terrible shower. Dreadful, dreadful. Not so much a party, more a few people round to dinner. <laughs> people still have this illusion of Prescott that he's a proper old-fashioned socialist, and of course he's not. He's just a fat bloke with a northern accent. <laughs> The fact that you can see someone's vest through their shirt doesn't make them a socialist. The truth of the matter is that the Labour left, many of them very, very sincere socialists, have dedicated themselves to driving a vehicle for change which simply does not work. The election of the Labour government is not the end of the story. It is going to lead to a crisis inside the working class in which up for grabs is the question of what leadership we need, what organisation we need, what party we lead. Now, one of the biggest lessons I ever learned, I went to the miners' strike in 1984, I was up in South Yorkshire, and uh, comrades took me there, SWP comrades took me there, I was a young firefighter, there I am on the picket line looking at this whole thing, and you see all the police ranged up, and you think, this isn't a fight between the miners and the National Coal Board, the bloody whole of the state has been mobilised in order to make sure yeah. that the miners were smashed, and in that moment I understood completely that on our side we needed organisation which could comple completely silhouette that of the state to move our resources to meet theirs. That's why I became a socialist, that's why I'm a revolutionary, that's why I'm in the SWP. Tony Benn got 3.2 million votes to be deputy leader of the Labour Party in 1981. He must have had 250,000 to 300,000 active supporters. Why the total vote for the defence clause for in the whole Labour Party was only 9,000? What happened to the other 250,000 or 300,000? What happened? Why the hell did they disappear? And I'll tell you why they disappeared. Because the whole parliamentary concept 
is concept of passivity. Once in five years, you have to vote. You spend three minutes to put a cross if you are slow. If you are quick, you do it in one minute. For the rest of the five years, you do absolutely perfect nothing. And this leads to passivity, and this leads to demoralization. I think uh, the pressure is going to build up. My own opinion is that uh, the head of steam behind the Labour victory in, on May the 1st was a head of steam that hasn't worked its way through yet. And uh, certainly the balance of power between capital and Labour has to be tilted back towards Labour. Do you think there will be more disputes, more conflict in the future? Yes, I certainly think there will. I think there will be much more conflict because people now feel that it's no longer the case that the majority of people in the country support the Tory union laws, the Tory policies, the privatisation. That isn't the case. Whatever you say they do support, they certainly don't support the Tories. So people are going to feel, well, since the government doesn't, su doesn't support privatisation, doesn't support union bashing, in words at any rate, let's test them out. Let's now use our strength a bit and try and get back some of the things that we lost over all the Thatcher years. For some, the struggle's already begun. For people like the Hillingdon hospital workers, fighting racism, financial hardship, even their own union leadership. This, this 22 month, we know who is our friend. Working class, they, they're supporting us the day one. But it's very hard. It's very hard. How can you think if you are family, your relative is no job? And they are saying a British justice is the best done all over the world. We are here. What is the justice for us? The man they put in, he was there 42 days, up, the hatchet man. 42 days and he sat men with 42 years service. And he bragged in the papers afterwards that he wanted a greenfield site. People with a can-do attitude. Well, he hasn't got a greenfield site. He's got another green and common. We've got tents, caravans, and we've got fires, and we are going to stay there. We've got a 24-hour picket line. The women have got a leafleting line. They've had a 61 and a half million share fall and we're going to keep on fighting until we win. Good luck to the Hillingdon workers and the doctors as well. <laughs>